Hi guys, I'm excited to say that I broke my old Reigns record again. I've had a lot of time to work on the game because of the virus going around, and so I spent a few days getting back into it in the hopes that I'd be able to break the 300 year mark, and I did. In the background of the footage, I'll be talking about the exact strategies that I use to break this record and how you can just as easily get 200, even 300 years using these tips. I'm going to be talking about what you should know going into this video, which is uh, overview of how to work the powers in your favor, how to win duels, how to know which cards are traps or gateways into bad sequences of related cards, how to get your game set up to get long runs, and some more advanced stuff. So, um, a complete breakdown of effects, so which effects are the best, which are the worst, which ones are alright some of the time, how to strategically sacrifice your resources throughout the game, how to minimize your chance of dying of old age, how to give yourself a chance to cheat death, even in the worst case scenarios, and a few other tricks to extend your reign and optimize things even further. So, let's get into it. Before going into this video, I'll expect that you'll be somewhat familiar with the game and a lot of the card outcomes. You'll probably, you should probably have at least played it through one full time if you're expecting to get super long runs and that's literally all you need to know. So, first, an overview of how to work the powers. When I see a lot of people playing reigns, I notice that their primary goal is always to keep all four powers near the middle. And while this is exactly what the game encourages you to do, it isn't actually optimal. So unless you have a lot of experience in the game, you might not realize that all four powers are not created equal. Sorry about any noises in the background, by the way. Uh, I'm recording this right next to a furnace, which is being pretty loud. Anyways, back to the powers. To get it out of the way, money is by far the most valuable of the four resources. Because most of the actions in the game that benefit the other powers, the church, the people, and the army, they require money. If you've ever had the clarity effect, where you can see exactly what your stats are, then you'll know that your powers are measured from 1 to 100. And so, in terms of this scale, I'd say the best spot to keep your money is somewhere from like 70 to 80, which is nowhere near the middle, it's quite a bit higher. And this isn't always possible to achieve, and you'll see that throughout the run, I'm not always stocked up on money as much as I'd like, but this is what I'd like it to be if it were optimal. So, it's sort of a sub-goal that you should always be working towards, filling up on money more than like midway mark. And the population meter is also relatively difficult to keep high up, so I would also say it's better to keep the people probably around 60 to 70. And so the church and army are the two powers that I'd say, yeah, try to keep them somewhere around the middle, because they're not too difficult to replenish, but they're also pretty easy to deplete if they're ever too high. And so the point of all this is to give you a more accurate balance of powers to be constantly working towards. Instead of making your decisions thinking that your end goal should always be to keep everything around 50%, it's not the case. You should be trying to keep your money around 80 and your people around 60 or 70. An example of when you would use this is if you have the option to raise your money to 70. You have a card that will let you get 20 more money or whatever and it'll raise your money to 70, but it would cause your church to fall down to 30 or even 20. Most people wouldn't take this option because you're going, you're straying from the middle, right? But it's still worth it to take this option because money is much more valuable than the church. So the next thing I'm going to be talking about is how to navigate the dungeon fast and efficiently. So if you're anything other than a beginner, then you should already know how to do this, but if not, I'll be teaching it here. So, first and foremost, gold doors lead to treasure chests. Treasure chests can contain a key, a torch, or a potion. All three are beneficial. So keys obviously let you out of the dungeon, torches allow you to see crumbling walls and break through them and get to places you wouldn't be able to get to without torches, and potions uh, increase all of your stats, giving you more time in the dungeon, right? Because when you're in the dungeon, all of your stats are constantly depleting, and if all of your stats run out, then you die. But as long as you have one stat that's not completely depleted, then you'll be able to keep going. So potions allow you to keep being in the dungeon longer and longer. Another way to replenish your stats in the dungeon is to duel and beat the skeleton. However, I don't recommend this during um, a reign where you're trying to go for a long time because you won't always be able to kill the skeleton because duels are partially based off of luck. And if you don't kill the skeleton, this is a life or death situation and you will die and end your reign. 
but if you do beat the skeleton, all of your stats will be refilled, and you'll be able to keep being in the dungeon for a bit longer. Um, so, to use keys, you'll need to find a doorway out of the dungeon, and you can do this by going through air doors. Air doors usually lead to doorways out. Um, to get to air doors, you can go through either salt doors, earth doors, or water doors. And so, um, this is kind of spoiling how to beat the game, like get the good ending, but in order to find the friendly skeleton and unlock it, I'll just tell you the doors you need to go through right here. You need to find a torch first, and then go through the fire door, then the arsenic door, then the acid door, break the wall, go through the saltpeter door, and then go through the pentagram door, and then you'll find the skeleton there. And in order to get Excalibur, this is also kind of spoiling a secret of the game, but most people will never figure this out otherwise. Go through the earth door, then the fire door, then the water door, then the acid door, and finally the sword door, and you'll find Excalibur in a chest in that room. So next I'm going to talk about duels. Um, you should do your best to avoid duels with stakes attached, so this means no dueling anything that could kill you and end your reign. So no dueling skeletons in the dungeon or dueling the barbarian or any other characters if they threaten you, but you can do friendly duels, like when the general's like, hey, do you want to duel for fun? Uh, it'll increase your military, like, there's no reason not to. Um, but anyways, the game doesn't explain to you the best strategy for duels. It doesn't explain to you that you win a duel by knocking the other person out of the arena, not by killing them. And so the arena is that part of the card at the top of your, your screen, right, when you're in a, the middle of a duel, and it shows you and your opponent. It's the part where you can preview your moves. So as long as you stay around the middle of that arena, it's impossible for you to die, because it's impossible for you to get knocked so far, unless it's with, like, a crazy special move, that you'll get knocked all the way from the middle out of the arena. And so what counts as the middle is very small, unfortunately. You can see under the place where you and your opponent are having your fight, there's eight circles that's like in a line that stretch across the arena, and you can end up in any one of these eight circles depending on which moves you choose. Always try to stay within the middle two circles. You can see those are the only ones that are white instead of red for danger. Um, when previewing your moves, yeah, choose the one that will bring you closest to these middle two circles unless you believe you can knock the enemy out of the arena. And special moves are one other thing to consider. You shouldn't rely on them. They're gained by charging up your... by defending for a turn. And then you gain the ability to special move on your next move. And while these can sometimes kill the enemy, they can also backfire on you. And so it's worth it to be cautious when using them. So now to set your game up to get long runs. First, I want you to notice what year am I in. Right? It's thousands of years past the devil's last visit in 1998. Basically, after the devil appears for the last visit, and you don't get one of the endings, you can just keep playing indefinitely. So to avoid getting any of the endings is the key here, just don't use the devil's last death, death wish. So after the devil comes and goes in 1998, and he gives you that power where the next person you say yes to will die, just say no to everybody, and then it'll wear off after 100 years, and basically your game becomes sandbox mode. If you don't want to wait these 100 years, then you can use your last death wish. Just make sure it's not on Clock, who's the friendly skeleton, or the spirit of the fallen, as these will trigger some of the endings. Um, I'm not going to spoil what they are, because that's part of the game. And so, one more thing you should be doing leading up to the time in 19 1998 is to unlock the vase and the friendly skeleton, because these are two of the most useful characters in the game, but they're not explicitly like easy to unlock. So next, I'm going to be talking about the effects. There are 21 possible effects you can get in reigns, but if you're playing after 1998 like I am, there's only 19 because two of them, Diabolus and Death Wish, shouldn't happen after this. As you can see, there's only four slots for effects uh, in the bottom right corner of your screen, and so you can only ever have four effects going at any given time. If you acquire a fifth effect with four other ones already in effect, then the oldest effect active will be erased. So, I've broken the effects into four categories, the ones that are worth getting, the ones that can be helpful but are better not to go for because they could take up space that the ones worth getting could alternatively take up, uh, the ones that straight up have no effects on your gameplay, and then the ones that are damaging to your reign and should be avoided at all costs. So the first tier that I'm going to be talking about is contains all the effects that you should ever take. You should never take an effect that's not in the first tier. And so there's seven effects in this tier. They give by far the best benefits. So, 
First of all, safeguards are in this category, and by safeguards I mean the communal barn, high walls, central bank, and cathedral. So these are the buildings that if you ever reach zero in one stat that they, that they correspond to, then you can keep playing and you won't actually die. The next effect in this category is clarity because it shows you your exact stats, enough said. Um, another great effect is the spice trade effect, also known as the Silk Road. I normally advise against effects with a continuous change on your stats because usually they're hard to control, but with the Silk Silk Road, all it does is increase your money very slowly. It's not very hard to control, I mean, at all. All you have to do with is idle with it for a while and you can basically get as much money as you want. And so the last effect that I'm going to put in the top category is Theocracy, where you must say yes to the church. And again, I normally advise against effects that force you to make certain decisions. But just like Silk Road, Theocracy is very easy to control, and it grants you unlimited money because your money category is frozen. So you don't need to worry about money. It is really easy to play the game after that. And so to summarize, the only effects you should ever pursue are the Communal Barn, High Walls, Central Bank, Cathedral, Clarity, Silk Road, and Theocracy. The next tier is stuff that you may think is useful but actually takes up space that you'd be better off filling with the A tier effects. So these effects are Excalibur, Mount Care, Loaded Dice, and the Slave Trade I'm gonna if you put here. So these effects all give some benefits, but they aren't good enough or they come with some drawbacks that make them obsolete. So if you play your cards right, pun intended, yes, there's no scenario in which you'll ever need to use the effects of Mount Care or Loaded Dice or Excalibur. And for the slave trade, yes, the only effect it has is continually increasing your money, just like Silk Road, but it increases your money by 10 every second and this is basically impossible to control. So, the third category is stuff that either has no effect on your gameplay and just takes up space, or effects that are damaging but not too hard to control. So the effects go as follows, Blue Mushroom, Strawberry, Diabolus and Death Wish, Enter the Pungent, Old Age, and Lover. I'm not going to talk much about these, just avoid them please, they don't do much for you. And the next, the last category is Crusader, Black Death, and Colonies. So these are all bad for obvious reasons. They're very hard to control and they don't contribute much to your kingdom. So now that the effects are covered, I'm gonna talk about how to cheat death as often as possible. If I went too fast for you in the effects, I'll put them in the description. So how to cheat death. There's ways and reigns where you can avoid dying even if you fill up or deplete a resource and you don't have the corresponding safeguard. Now obviously if you have a safeguard, you can afford to sacrifice that resource more than usual or even deplete it in order to get your other powers up. You'll notice I do that frequently with people and the barn, respectively. So, if you don't have a safeguard, then the best way to die is filling up your church meter. Because 20% of the time, not exactly, but I found about 20% of the time, you will survive this without a cathedral. Basically, the standard way you die when you fill up your church meter is getting murdered by a pagan mob during your escape attempt, right? That's what the game tells you. But sometimes, it will say you escape the mob by fleeing into the pungent. And this is the dungeon, obviously. When you escape the pungent, everything will be back to normal and you can keep going. And so a similar thing happens if you fill up your people meter. Uh, occasionally, the, the jester guy will step in and offer to play Red Dwarf with you. And if you beat him, then you'll lose 40% of your population stat, which is good because you can keep playing your reign. Your population is no longer full. So obviously, if you can avoid it, don't die in these ways because you won't always survive. But... Sometimes you will survive, and so these are the best ways to die if you must choose. So next, I'm going to discuss something most new players don't consider, which is how to minimize your chances of dying of old age. So the first thing is simple. If the doctor ever recommends uh, something related to your health, then you should always listen, even if it negatively affects your stats. So if he tells you to stop riding, stop riding, stuff like that. And so secondly, don't ever eat the queen's cake when she offers it to you. It seems like it's a free way to just increase your people points a bit, but in fact, it speeds up you dying from old age so much. And there's no more frustrating feeling in Reigns than dying from old age, because you didn't inherently do anything wrong, it feels like, when you do die of old age, but uh, you just end your reign anyways. So, so next, if the doctor offers you a potion, don't take it. This is very specific. Uh, there's a single card where the doctor offers you a potion, and... It sounds like it's going to make you older, but in fact, uh, it sounds like it's going to make you younger, sorry, but in fact, it makes you older. Um, 
Finally, the way to gain immunity from dying old age won't happen every single run, and when it does happen, then you can basically keep playing forever, and what happens is the vase will sometimes offer you a potion to make you look 10 years younger, when really it grants you immunity from dying of old age, right? And so he'll offer it to you probably like a third of the time you'll get the offer, otherwise it's just down to luck and there's nothing you can do. Finally, I'm going to talk about a few specific tricks that you can use with certain cards. So firstly, sometimes the foreign princess will offer you a peace treaty. She'll say it'll allow you 10 years of peace, when really it's just 10 years of nothing happening at all, and this is a free way to gain, gain 10 years on your reign. And so, second, if your stats are too low or too high and you think you're in serious danger of losing, go to the pungent, because when you, lose, when you leave the pungent, all of your stats are refilled by 30. Right, and you can also wait in the pungent if one of your stats is too high, let it deplete for a bit, and then leave knowing that everything will be refilled anyways. That's about it for this video. I feel like I probably said I'd cover something that I didn't. If you do want to know more, then I'll let you know in the comments. Anyways, I'll let you watch the rest of this, and see you guys next time. Guarda, mi dico il punto. Pd, pd, ovo, ovo, de. Che, oh, olim. Già, quattro, le.